My name is Connie Potter. I'm with the National Archives and Records Administration, and I'll be talking about census records. I'm going to give a brief introduction, then talk about the census records from 1790 until 1870, and then census records from 1880 until 1930. When working with census records, it's important to remember a few things. One, this is oral history. No one had to provide information to verify that what they said was correct. And because it's oral information, frequently people mispronounce names, people didn't spell the names correctly. Also, the census takers could have very bad handwriting, so you can't always read the handwriting. You don't always know who provided the information. And so the information may be inaccurate because a neighbor or a family member that wasn't as familiar with everyone in the family might have provided the information. Also, the census reflects what happened the previous 10 years. And we'll see some examples of that as I go through the questions. And finally, not everyone was counted. Article 1, Section 3 of the Constitution provides for taking the census. And the Constitution reads, representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states which may be included within this union according to their respective numbers which shall be determined by adding to the whole number of free persons including those bound to service for the term of years and excluding Indians not taxed three-fifths of all other persons. The actual enumeration shall be made within three years of the first meeting of the Congress of the United States and within every subsequent term of 10 years in such manner as they shall direct by law. So the first census was taken in August of 1790, and it's been taken every 10 years since then. The census is closed for 72 years after it is taken, and they are arranged by census year, state, then county, and beginning in 1880 enumeration district. We generally recommend that you start with the most recent census and work backwards, although I'm going to start with the first census and move forwards. Census records from 1790 until 1840 generally list just the head of the household, and they give statistical information on everyone else in the household. Now, the head of the household can include a man, a woman, or an African American if they are free in the head of the household. This example from the 1790 census shows, one, the condition that some of the records were when we received them. And the person on the second line is Samuel Adams. The person on the first line is John Hancock. Samuel Adams, had the, he was one white free male, age 16 and older, and in his household was another free white male, under 16. There were free, three free white females, there were no other people, and he held no slaves. This census took nine months to take. Later on, it was either two weeks or two months, depending on whether the area counted was in the city or in the country. And from 1790 until 1820, the marshals who took the census used whatever piece of paper they had on hand. There were no printed forms. So using the early censuses can be a little difficult because you sometimes need to go back to the first page to figure out what the questions are. And if your ancestor's on the fourth page, you don't necessarily know what the questions are until you go back to the top of the page. In 1830, they finally printed the census schedules, but it was still a statistical summary. On line four is, on line four is Samuel Yoder, and there are two males between 10 and 15, one between 15 and under 20, and one male 30 and under 40. There's one female under five, and then one female in each of the categories, five and under 10, 15 and under 20, 20 and under 30. So to use the records, you, you need to know the ages of the people in the family but what you can also look at are the other people in the neighborhood to see if there are other families that might have been related. So you want to read the entire census page in these early censuses, or if not, the entire, uh, the entire township or, or county. You can see this is a two-page schedule, and it says at the top, by the marshal and the district from which it was taken. 
Beginning in 1850, they list everyone in the household, but they don't give you their relationship. But it lists um, the men, the women, the children, servants, and sometimes you can tell a little bit of the relationship by the occupation. For example, it might list that somebody was a servant. In 1850 and 1860, there are separate free and slave schedules. This is the 1870 census for Prescott, Arizona, and you get the name of the person, their age, sex, and race, their occupation, and where they were born. The final question, the final question reflects went on the previous decade. This is the 1870 census and it refers back to the Civil War. And in column, the last column, it asks if you are a male 21 years of age or over, and have you been denied the right to vote on other than a crime or the late rebellion? This is referring to the men on, who received the right to vote under the 15th Amendment, where you could vote regardless of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Women could not vote, so this refers to the black men who were slaves who were freed under the 15th Amendment after the Civil War. This is a slave schedule for Maryland in 1850. The slave schedules rarely, rarely give the name of the slave. It usually gives the name of the slave owner or the person who um, was working with the, with the slave. Now this one isn't particularly um, difficult. If you, if you knew your family, for example, your family member um, had been owned by, the, um, by Mrs. Pierce, there are only four slaves listed. But on some of the slave schedules that can go on for page and page and page, Jefferson Davis in Mississippi has many pages of slaves. And it would be almost impossible to determine using these records if your ancestor was a slave for Jefferson Davis. Beginning in 1880, they list the relationship to the head of the household. It also, starting in 1900, provides citizenship information. The year of immigration, naturalization status, whether naturalized, N-A, whether they filed their first papers, P-A, or they were an alien, A-L. And in 1920, it gives the year of naturalization. The records are also arranged by enumeration districts. And those are areas within the county that an enumerator could cover in either two weeks or one month, depending on whether they're in the city or the country. This, uh, also in 1880, for the first time, it lists, oh, in cities only, the name of the street and the house number, so you can get the address beginning in 1880. 1880 census, for the, fir for the first and only time, asks health questions. And was the person blind? Uh, they use phrases that we might not use now, but they ask if you're deaf and dumb, an idiot, insane, maimed, crippled, or disabled. And some of the examples they use, not examples, but some of the diseases they put down may not be familiar to you, but just get on um, the internet and search for a medical dictionary and you can frequently get the answer that way. On line 15, you see Andrew Davis is a white male, age 70. He's a ship carpenter, born in Maine, and his father and mother are both both born in Maine, so you know at least for that time you don't need to look at immigration records. The other people in the household are Mary, a daughter, 41, a teacher, and Lucinda, also a sister, keeps house. The 1890 census was destroyed as a result of a, a fire in the Department of Commerce, but part of the 1890 veteran census survives. It's important to remember that the 1890 census was done by the Bureau of the Census. This census was done by the VA, it was done by the census under the direction of the VA. The first, the states from Alabama through Kansas are missing. We just have Kentucky through Wyoming, but fortunately Washington, D.C. is listed under Washington, D.C. and not District of Columbia. 
And this will give the name of the uh, soldier, what unit he was in, uh, what his health problems were. Now the census is surviving soldiers, sailors, marines, and widows of the Union. However, fortunately, people don't always follow directions. So you can find information as far back as the War of 1812 and the Mexican-American War and Confederate soldiers. This is the 1930 census, the one, the most recent census that's available. This one gives you, um, for the first time, how much do you pay rent, monthly rent for your house, or did you buy your house? If so, for how much? Do you have a radio? It gives the place of birth of not only the person, but the father and the mother. And this started in 1880. It also asks if you're a veteran of any wars. And they ask that frequently on the, on the census records. Um, so that they know how many, it gives you an idea of what they're going to have to pay in pensions. And in 1930, they give both the occupation and the industry. And President Hoover, his um, occupation is President of the United States, but his industry is federal employee. These records are available on microfilm at the National Archives building in Washington, D.C., and in some of the regional facilities, but you need to check with each facility to see what they have, if it's on site, how you can get a hold of it. They're online at Ancestry.com, Footnote, which is a partial list, Heritage Quest, and these are available at National Archives facilities free of charge, although they are subscription-based um, online services and mail order for a fee, and you can get information at order online at www.archives.gov.